We're going to open our Bibles to Acts chapter 21 and continue our look at Paul's return to Jerusalem from his third missionary journey. Now, he's on a boat that is cutting across the northeast corner of the Mediterranean. We know that because it says it in Acts 21, verse number 3. It says, when we came in sight of Cyprus, that's the big island up there in the northeast corner, having it on our left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. Now, he is on a time schedule, as we found out. Uh, He left Philippi uh, back in Macedonia sometime shortly after Passover. And he wants to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And we know that there's seven weeks between those two holidays. So he's already burned up a couple of those weeks, possibly as much as three of those weeks. And he needs to make it uh, the rest of the way uh, in order to give him some um, opportunity Uh, to be at Jerusalem for the 25th anniversary of the birth of the church, Pentecost of 58. Uh, I think he's going to have no problem making it, but he will run into a problem once he gets there. And that's where I want to focus our starting attention today. Uh, It says in verse number four uh, that having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. So they're staying at Tyr, at Tyre, uh, which is part of Phoenicia, and that's just up the coast from Judea. And as he already told the uh, apo- excuse me, the elders from Ephesus, every place that he's going on this trip now, he's being warned that arrest and trouble awaits him in Jerusalem. And so that's what he hears too. Through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Now, Paul's response in each one of these situations seems to be, I need to go there. It doesn't matter that I'm going to get arrested. It doesn't matter that I might be killed. I have to go to Jerusalem. But I am going to give you my personal opinion on this, my personal feeling. And then you can do with it whatever you wish. I think this was the Holy Spirit waving him off, telling him, don't land here. Go do something else, but don't come here because it will put you on the shelf for a while. And it does. He ends up being uh, in custody in Roman house arrest for four years. Now, he's still getting ministry done, and he writes several of his letters during that time period, But he wasn't free to move around the Roman Empire during those four years. Uh, People had to come to him or letters had to go out. And so I think this is actually God telling him, look, don't come here because it will change your mission opportunities. So that's my opinion. Uh, The Apostle Paul chooses not to listen to it. Uh, But as you will see... Uh, the people giving him the information seem to be of my same opinion, that if he can avoid it, he ought to. So verse number five, when our days there were ended, that is the seven days, we departed and went on our journey, and they all with wives and children accompanied us until we were outside the city, and then kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. So while they were doing the whole offload, onload of the ship cargo, Paul spends a week uh, with the believers at Tyre, enjoying their hospitality and probably teaching uh, them, maybe evangelizing a little bit uh, along with them. But now... He's ready to continue his journey, despite them telling him, don't go. Don't go. The Holy Spirit is saying, if you go, you're going to get arrested. Verse number seven. When we had finished the voyage from Deir, we arrived at Ptolemais, 
which is just a little bit farther down the coast, uh, we are now in the territory of the ancient Holy Land. Uh, If you look at a map of the Middle East, look at a map of Israel today, there's a little bump uh, that sticks out into the Mediterranean. Uh, That is the northwest end of Mount Carmel, a ridge line. Uh, that is part of the geophysical features of the Holy Land. And there's a bay that is north of that. And on the north side of that bay is where Ptolemaeus is located. So that's their next port of call. And it says, we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. Apparently a little bit of ship business needed to be taken care of there. So they had an overnight, it seems like. On the next day, we departed and we came to Caesarea. Now, Caesarea was the premier harbor, man-made harbor. It was put together at the order of King Herod the Great uh, back uh, at the tail end of the first century BC. So since this is 58 that we're looking at this, this harbor is roughly 70 years old. Uh, And... Uh, It is the place everyone pretty much comes in and out of uh, Judea uh, when they're coming across the Mediterranean. And so, while they're at that great big port city, it says, We entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now, you might remember that Philip was one of those that helped feed the the poorer members of the very early Jewish church at Jerusalem and Judea. He then went and evangelized by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, Samaria. And then after that, he was involved in the evangelism of the eunuch of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And then after that, he went to Azotus, which was one of the coastal cities, and he was preaching the gospel. And then he'd worked his way up the coast until he finally came to Caesarea. And that's apparently where he settled down for the last 20-some years, being an evangelist, preaching and teaching uh, about Jesus to anyone that will listen. And so we are told in verse number 9, that he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So he has raised his family here. And four of his daughters are apparently still teenagers, young, uh, and they have the gift of prophecy. Uh, Most likely we're talking about through the laying on of one of the apostles' hands uh, so that they are able to give information. Uh, It's not specifically said here that they told Paul anything, but I do believe it might be implied that these four unmarried prophetic daughters of Philip told him what was coming. What we do have specifically starts in verse number 10. While we were staying for many days, now by the time they get to Caesarea, this is what they know. It's only two days walk up to Jerusalem. So by now he knows if he just leaves the week before Pentecost from Caesarea, he will be in Jerusalem with plenty of time to spare uh, for the day of Pentecost, which always falls on the first day of the week. Uh, So he has to head up there uh, the week before. So He knows he's got the time to spend here at Caesarea. So while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So the word has gotten out. Like I said, it's only a two-day walk up to Jerusalem, and it's very busy traffic between Jerusalem uh, and Caesarea because this is the port city for Judea. And so the news has gotten from the church in Caesarea to the church in Jerusalem that Paul is back in country. He's down at Philip the Evangelist's house. So a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, 
coming to us, remember Luke is the one telling this all firsthand because he's right there. Coming to us, he took Paul's belt. So this would be the the belt that goes around the waist. It kind of keeps the uh, the clothing in line. He took Paul's belt and he bound his own feet and hands. So he, I don't know if Paul had his belt just laying around or what the deal was, but Agabus grabs the belt and kind of wraps it around his own his own hands and around his own feet uh, and is prophetically demonstrating something here. Uh, many of the prophets uh, would act things out. You can see that in the ministry of Jeremiah who wore a yoke or uh, Ezekiel who laid on his side for more than a year. But uh, Agabus acts this out and he says, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So that is pretty much the message he's been getting for most of this return boat trip, is that if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to get arrested. And in this case, you'll be arrested by the Jews but you'll end up in the hands of the Gentiles. That's very specific. Now, verse 12, when we heard this, that's Luke telling us that. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. So the way they heard this was, God's warning you off, Paul. God's giving you a heads up. So stay away. Don't go up there. You don't have to. You don't have to be the one that goes up there and delivers this money. It's not required for you to be in Jerusalem uh, before you head off to Rome and then from there on out to uh, to uh, Hispania. Just don't do it. And that, I believe, would have been what I would have been saying as well. Don't do it. God is giving you the chance not to to be put on a shelf. But listen to what Paul says. Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? So they're they're crying as they plead with him. For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So this is another reason why I keep emphasizing his His attitude and his mind has shifted in the last few weeks, in the last couple of months since he left Corinth uh, and went back through Macedonia and then got on that boat uh, and started coasting uh, along the coast until he gets to uh, 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 Caesarea. Before uh, he started getting these messages, uh, when he wrote the book of Romans and First and Second Corinthians, his plan was a one of a great excitement that he would come to Jerusalem, uh, come to Rome, and that he would also get out to Spain with the assistance of the Roman believers. But that's all now out the window, because he seems to be convinced that his fate is to die at Jerusalem, just like his Lord, and uh, some of this. I'm going to speculate here. All of you can appreciate when we're allowed to speculate. I think some of this is that he feels that he kind of deserves this sort of end to his life because he was a persecutor of the church, that he'd done such great damage at the very beginning, and he felt like he ought to be one of those ones that lays down his life uh, for the Savior. And so I believe that is his mindset. And uh, Luke apparently believes something along that line too, because he writes, since he would not be persuaded, we ceased. So we gave up on trying to convince him not to go to Jerusalem. And we said, let the will of the Lord be done. Now, we already know the story ahead of time, don't we? Paul is not killed at Jerusalem. He is imprisoned, or shall we say, kept under 
house or um, palace arrest for two years at Caesarea itself, the very place that he's at right in this moment in the story. Uh, and then he spends two more years under house arrest in his own privately paid for apartment in Rome itself. But he is not executed at the end of his trial. Uh, he is released and he goes on to uh, write several more letters uh, and uh, travels back to uh, Ephesus and up into uh, Macedonia and other places. He may have even actually made it out to Spain. That's a very good possibility. Uh, he is not killed for several more years after this event. And so that just strengthens, I think, in my mind uh, that he was incorrect in his assumption that he had a fate to meet at Jerusalem on this particular close to the third missionary journey. So that's, that's my opinion, that's my thinking, and I'm always open to hear what you have to say on the topic, and you can contact me. Uh, verse 15, after these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. So a whole bunch of the people are going to be heading up because a lot of these folks are Jewish. And uh, the Jewish tradition is, if you're living inside the boundaries of the promised land and you're a male, uh, you are supposed to go to Jerusalem for Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And so these guys are in the habit of taking off, you know, a couple of weeks uh, and going and living at Jerusalem. So that's where they're all getting ready to go to, Jerusalem for, pa for Pentecost. Verse 16, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus or Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. Uh, so Nason is apparently Jewish. He is from Cyprus, which is the same island that Barnabas was from, by the way. Uh, and he apparently has a house at Jerusalem. And that's where the traveling companions of Paul and Paul himself have been invited to spend their time at Jerusalem. Verse number 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. Now, that's a reference to the believers in Jesus. Now, since we're talking about Jerusalem, the vast majority of the believers are Jewish, ethnic Jews that believe that Yehoshua is Hamashiach. Jesus is Messiah. And so they have a concern that they want to address with the Apostle Paul that I think some people misunderstand. Uh, and I've heard people critique Paul uh, for agreeing to do what he does here. And I don't think that critique is merited, and I'll explain as we move. Uh, here's what happens. On the following day, so this is the day after he arrives at Jerusalem, Paul went in with us to James. Now, James here is James, the half-brother of Jesus, who had apparently been designated by Jesus himself to be the apostle to the Jewish church at Jerusalem. And uh, that was done apparently during the resurrection appearances. It's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, that Jesus appeared to him. And so he has been very heavily involved in the leadership of the Jewish church for the last 25 years. Because that this is the 25th year anniversary of the start of the church. Uh, so James was there, and all the elders were present. So we've got the leadership of the church that are the spiritual leaders. Uh, after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now, he has done this on all his missionary journeys. After he gets done, he reports back to uh, people at Antioch and now also at Jerusalem. This is what we did on the missionary journey. This is what we did 
uh, in preaching and teaching the gospel and establishing churches and putting leaders in place. So he's giving a mission report. Verse number 20. When they heard it, they glorified God. So they are excited about this because a lot of churches have been established. A lot of believers have come into the faith. But they do have a concern. They said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. So all of these Jewish believers in Jesus... Uh, are excited about having the Messiah save them, but they are also still very much committed to their traditional lifestyle. Uh, They still circumcise the little baby boys on the eighth day of life. Uh, They still uh, go to synagogue service on the Sabbath, and they still keep kosher, and uh, they probably, some of them, still do phylacteries, and uh, do the whole prayer shawl things, all of that. So they have been doing the traditional things still. Nothing wrong with that. So verse 21, they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to their cu- our customs. So this is the rumor that's going around. The rumor that they've been hearing is that everywhere the Apostle Paul is going on his missionary journeys, he is telling Jewish believers, you have to give up your Jewishness. You have to abandon Judaism in order to be saved by Jesus. And that is not by any stretch of the imagination what he's been doing. Uh, The only strong thing he said in that area is this, Gentiles can't be forced to become Jewish in order to be saved. See, that was his battle against the Judaizers. So now he's going to have to try to convince his Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ that he is not an anti-Jewish person. So verse number... 22. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. So they're concerned that there's going to be turmoil in the church because uh, the Apostle Paul is in town. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Uh, These men have taken apparently a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow is uh, typically something you do on your own where you say that you're going to do something, and until it is accomplished, you don't drink wine or any th- eat anything from the grapevine. You uh, don't touch strong drink at all. You uh, don't touch dead bodies at all. Uh, and you don't cut your hair or your beard. And so it was a very common vow of commitment. And then when you were done with whatever you'd committed to, you would go through a ceremony to show you were finished with it, and you would typically end up cutting your hair as part of that. You may remember that the Apostle Paul cut his hair at Cancrea as he was getting ready to return to Jerusalem on this. And I told you at the time, more than likely, he considered his vow, his Nazarite vow, completed at that point, cut his hair, and would take his... uh, Uh, hair clippings with him to Jerusalem uh, to go through this very ceremony that they've asked him to take care of. So this is what they say. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, pay for their expenses so that they may shave their heads. And thus all will know that there is nothing in what has been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the law. Now, Paul does not have a problem with that. You may remember he wrote, he says, to the Jewish people, I become like a Jew. To the Gentile people, I become like a Gentile. And so here he is amongst Jewish believers in Jesus. He is already in the habit of doing the Nazarite vow himself when he goes on his missionary journeys. And so that it's no big deal to him to say, sure, 
I'll um, I'll pay for the expenses to have four other believers in Jesus finish up their Nazarite vow. Yeah, we'll do it together. And uh, the church believes, the church leaders, including James, believes this will put to rest the idea that Paul is some sort of anti-Semitic, every Jew needs to abandon Judaism uh, campaigner, because he most certainly is not. And none of us should be either. Uh, If Jewish people wish to be traditional Jewish and believe in Jesus as Messiah, that's fine. If Gentile people wanted to do that, that'd be fine. If Gentiles or Jews wish to be uh, totally Gentileness in the way they carry out their life, that is, eat pork and, and dress a certain way and worship not on the Sabbath but on a Sunday, there's no problem with that. The problem that Paul has always had is when people try to force others to live by their standards that are not scriptural that are not mandated by Scripture. Uh, So this is not any type of um, problem for the Apostle Paul to do this. It is quite in keeping with everything that he has taught up to this point.